Alyssa, are you there? I'm here. Yeah. I we you're you're ah there you are. Hi everyone. So you've met Melissa Melissa before, but I wanted to uh, earlier today. But I wanted to add in um, that um, uh, I have felt that it's been essential that Melissa speak uh, to, to today at the conference because she's been studying uh, technological innovation for 25 years. Uh, you know specifically on breakthrough innovation uh, and breakthrough innovators. Um, her textbook uh, is the number one selling innovation textbook in the world, and so to have a uh, to have a uh, innovation conference without uh, hearing from Melissa um, uh, would be wrong. Uh, and so, um, for some reason, my title isn't uh, in front of me. But I guess you're gonna you're gonna tell us uh, uh, tell us what it is today. Oh, it was where do breakthrough ideas uh, come from? Um, and um, let's find out. Thank you for such a kind introduction, Foster. That was really nice of you. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen, everybody. Here we go. Uh, hopefully. Sorry, I'm gonna go up to the top. All right. Uh, now I can't see any of you. So hopefully everybody can hear me. If you can't hear me, Liz will text me, I suppose. I'm going to talk a little bit about where breakthroughs come from. And I want to first start by talking about what we mean by breakthrough, because people use this term sometimes pretty loosely in a lot of different ways. So let's start with the dictionary, uh, which actually, I don't think the dictionary knows exactly what it means by breakthrough yet either. It's got two pretty different definitions. The first one, which makes a lot of sense probably in this setting, is a sudden, dramatic, and important discovery or development. But the second definition they give is an instance of achieving success in a particular sphere or activity. So for an individual, for example, a, a breakthrough could be something that is not something that is a breakthrough to the world. So, so there's a little bit of a disconnect there. In innovation, we usually mean something that represents something with a large degree of change or improvement. And we're also often meaning that it's something that breaks through something, like breaks through performance limits, or breaks through norms or paradigms, or breaks through assumptions of what is possible. Now, breakthroughs, uh, by definition, ought to be kind of rare, and rare things are kind of hard to study. So I've been trying to study these for a long time, and I've taken a couple of different approaches, and I'm going to share some findings with you. One of them is that I've done multiple case studies of breakthrough innovators. Uh, so I have a book called Quirky that, that uh, highlights some of these, these case studies. Uh, I look at serial breakthrough innovators who are identified on multiple lists as being most famous innovator for multiple innovations or people whose innovations show up on most important innovation lists. And the key thing here was uh, I studied people who had multiple innovations because if you study a one hit wonder, someone who has one big innovation, it's very difficult to disentangle the effect of the person versus the context. Right, were they at the right place at the right time? You know, did something lucky happen? Whereas when you see someone who innovates over and over and over again, you start to think, hmm, there might, there's probably something about their search strategy or their personality or, or something about their resources. Maybe Let, let's try and figure out what that is and how we can harness it for everyone else. I've also studied breakthrough innovation in a fundamentally different way, which is to look at the patent database. So uh, I had a project a couple years back with a guy with a really fantastic scholar named Barack Aronson, where we took the entire USPTO database going back to 1969, and we mapped every patent to a position uh, using a vector of their subclasses that they did or did not have on that patent. And it's sort of an arduous process that required buying a really big computer. But when you do that, you can treat the whole patent world as a network. You can see who's located close to who, and you can get these network graphs of, of spaces in the patent database, which in itself is pretty interesting because you can see where firms are located, when they overlap, how they've changed over time, uh, which, which trajectories merged, which ones split. It's, it's a pretty cool thing. But when we were doing that, one of the things that we noticed that we hadn't actually initially expected were these weird outliers. So most of the patent database blooms like a flower, meaning that when you have some initial patents, those serve as a repository of learning or commercial opportunity that attract other inventors and they build on that by you know, maybe developing a new feature or a new application or applying it in a new context. And so most, most patents are actually positionally quite close to other patents. And what you're seeing on the right here is the 1985 snapshot of the biotechnology patent network, which is still pretty early in biotech, but you're seeing this flower bloom where a lot of the patents are located in that Central, central position, 17788, and, and that's what you expect, you expect a knowledge network to look like. But once in a while you see 
patents way out in some weird, you know, whoops, sorry, some weird white space not connected to anything. And they're, they're true outliers. And they had to be good enough to get, they had to be good enough, they had to be reasonably good to get granted as a patent in the first place. And a lot of these, as you might expect, don't get cited a lot or incorporated or built on a lot, but some of them do. And in fact, statistically, these outlier patents are disproportionately likely to become extremely highly cited patents, what, what a lot of researchers would call breakthrough patents. So I thought maybe we can take a sample of these outliers and compare them to other patents that are similar to them in time period and and, and uh, class space and things like that, sort of a match set, and compare them and see if there's anything we can identify that's systematically different about outliers versus non-outlier patents. So we compared them on things like how big was the inventor team, how much prior art was cited, how much prior patents had the inventor team patented, uh, uh, lots of things like that. We also ended up conducting interviews with inventors from 20 of the most outlier patents. And I, and I gotta tell you, that was a fascinating experience because we heard some incredible stories. One of them turned out to be the guy who won the Nobel Prize for his prion research. So we, we and honestly weren't even looking for that. We were just looking at outlierness of a patent and ended up getting a patent that won the Nobel Prize. So um, it was a super cool experience. And I'm just gonna jump straight to the key findings. And the first one is that breakthroughs often came from outsiders. And by outsiders, I mean people who had in some way atypical backgrounds for the field. So they might not have had the right educational credentials, or they might not have had any educational credentials, or they might have come from a different field. Uh, just people you didn't really expect. And there's this great quote from one of the interviews from Jason Gestwicki, who was an inventor on this patent uh, around surface plasma and resonance method for detecting glucose, really novel way of detecting glucose. And what he said in the interview unprompted was, look, I have a very different training than most people in the field. So I approached the problem with a distinct point of view. He was coming at it really differently than other people. And it enabled him to sort of ignore some of the norms and paradigms or typical perspectives and create something that was, was fundamental breakthrough. Uh, from my multiple case studies, I also saw lots of outsiders. So for example, on the bottom left there, you have Dean Kamen who had no medical training at all, doesn't have a college degree. It's actually not entirely clear he completed high school, but he did attend classes at Worcester Polytechnic for a while. Actually, no, let me correct that. He enrolled at Worcester Polytechnic and decided not to attend classes and instead decided that his tuition just gave him the right to go ask for consulting from professors. So definitely an unconventional rule breaker kind of guy. He ended up inventing the world's first portable drug infusion pump the world's first portable dialysis machine, several incredibly advanced prosthetic arms, and the iBot mobility wheelchair that can stand up on two wheels and, and balance and climb stairs. And from that, he ended up inventing the Segway personal transporter. And he did all of this without any medical training at all and very little electronics training either. So really an outsider. Then in the middle there, you have Jack Ma. Uh, Jack Ma, if you're not familiar with him, such an incredible underdog story came from a Chinese family of modest means and uh, failed the university exam a bunch of times, even got turned down when he applied to get hired at Kentucky Fried Chicken, but went on to found Alibaba, which is one of the world's leading e-commerce firms, actually generates more net income than Amazon, and also one of the world's leading AI firms and financial payments firms, uh, actually has by far and away the largest mobile payment system in the world called Alipay. So this is a person with really no background in the field, no, very little training, quite a remarkable story. And then of course on the right here, you have Elon Musk, who's been an outsider in a lot of fields and that never stopped him from inventing breakthroughs. But what I think is most notable is that he did not have a training in rocket science when he decided that we need to colonize Mars. And so he trained himself in rocket science. And I think there's a really powerful lesson there about the idea that we shouldn't be afraid to enter a field if we don't have the right credentials and to have more faith in our ability to master a subject on our own. Um, so it's kind of cool. Now looking at the patent data, you also see here uh, something very consistent with this idea that maybe there's a little bit of a knowledge penalty, meaning that when you're really trained and really experienced in an area, it probably gets harder for most people to look at it differently. Right? They get indoctrinated into the paradigms and the theories. They have expectations about how a problem and its solutions are supposed to work. And those expectations might 
uh, get in the way of achieving a fundamentally different kind of solution. So it, this might be part of why newcomers might have an advantage in coming up with a breakthrough idea. Now, it's, it's not, this is an average effect. It's not uniform. Certainly, many very well-trained people are very uh, good at thinking flexibly and about challenging assumptions. So you do have very well-trained people who invent breakthroughs. And of course, you have plenty of untrained people who never generate a breakthrough. But, but statistically, we found a strong negative association with prior patenting and producing an outlier. So this means that on average during this period, the people who invented outlier patents were either early in their career and hadn't invented, uh, haven't, hadn't filed many patents yet, or never filed many patents. And I find that it was, it was a really cool result. Now let's talk about key finding number two. Key finding number two is closely related to this same idea. And that is that breakthrough innovation often came from combining seemingly distant fields, fields that looked like they weren't connected. Somebody found a connection between them. So first I'm gonna start with a quote from the inventor interviews. This is James Murto who invented a method for extracting platelets from a blood sample without a centrifuge. It actually uses magnets. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. And uh, he says, he and I, we didn't limit ourselves to the industry norm. We look at things from a little bit of a different mindset. I work with a lot of different scientists and it's very unusual to find scientists that um, will take things they've learned from working on their car or on their plumbing at home. It's very unusual to go and find people who will go and look outside of their, I'm probably saying this terribly, but outside of their expertise or their ex scientific experience. So I'm gonna give you a little fun quiz here. What happens when you combine a world-renowned gastroenterologist who's trying to find a solution for visualizing the lower intestinal system? Now, for those of you who don't know, it's hard to visualize the lower intestinal system, like the small intestine, that's that long curvy thing you're seeing at the bottom of the picture. It's really hard to get into that. So if you have a problem in there, sometimes the only way to visualize it is surgical. It's also not pleasant to get into the large intestine, which is where like colonoscopies take place. So there, he was looking for a better way to get some, some optics into the gastrointestinal system when he became friends with a Israeli guided missile designer. Kind of an unusual friendship, you might think. But what happens when you combine a gastroenterologist with a problem visioning something and an Israeli guided missile designer? What you get is the pill cam, a camera pill that you can swallow and it will videotape its entire journey through your intestinal system. It's actually, there's a couple of versions now specialized, one specialized for the small intestine and one specialized for the large intestine. Both are FDA approved and it will generate basically an eight hour recording now, this makes for some interesting viewing on a Friday evening with popcorn, but I got to say there's some slow spots. Uh, what's more valuable is to take that recording and let a computer analyze it because a computer, they use a computer to identify uh, locations that might be suspicious bleeding. And that has helped them to identify lots and lots of unknown uh, bleeding problems in the small intestine in particular. So super, super cool invention from combining two seemingly really disconnected fields. It's basically a little, little tiny guided missile. All right, so again, now let's look at the patent data and if we see anything useful here. And what you find, again, is something super interesting. So first of all, we took every inventor on every patent in this um, set and we found every class in which they had ever patented prior to the focal patent we were gonna put in our analysis. So you get these long, uh, this long history of, of patenting and you gather up all the classes these individual patenters have invented in. So that then when you have the actual team on a focal patent, you can look at what is the collective breadth across the whole team. You can also look at what's the maximum breadth of any individual. And what we, because we were curious, what matters? Do you just need to have a diverse team? I mean, you could have a bunch of specialists working together. Each individual could be not diverse and have not much breadth. Uh, or you could have a bunch of generalists working together. Like there's a lot of different ways you could think about breadth at the team level. And most patents have more than one inventor on them. So this is a kind of an important question. What we found, which was, you know, again, we didn't, didn't really know what we to expect to find here, but we found that all of these things matter. So the collective breadth of the team has a really strong positive effect on your likelihood of generating an outlier, or it's, it's associated with the production of outliers. We'll put it that way to be careful about causality. Uh, but we also found that the maximum breadth of an individual mattered a lot 
and the additional breadth that you get from the rest of the team also mattered a lot. So it turns out that both matter. It's not one or the other. And this has some really cool implications for how you engineer your new product development teams if you're looking to get breakthroughs. So we found that, that pretty exciting. Okay, now I'm gonna go on to key finding number three. So sometimes breakthroughs, uh, let me go back and think about what people assume breakthroughs are a lot of the time. A lot of time people assume breakthroughs are luck, right? You stumble into something, something works differently than you expected or you make some discovery. And for sure that happens a lot. We found a lot of cases of just serendipity. There was one case where this team was looking at a result and it was coming out the reverse of what they expected. They couldn't explain it, so they brought a doctoral student on and said, here, for your thesis, just figure out why we're getting this upside down result. And that ended up generating an outlier and that was discovered you know, totally on accident. And there's certainly lots of anecdotal examples of things discovered on by accident, like post-it notes and super glue. But, but what's probably more common is that something looks like it came about all of a sudden, but it didn't really come about all of a sudden. It was the result of a very long search path and you didn't see the path. So it was actually lots and lots of incremental steps. But if nobody's writing articles on the individual steps or filing patents on the individual steps, from your perspective, we started here and we got to here overnight and, and it's kind of remarkable and, and amazing and you can't figure out how. So from the interviews, we, one of these outlier patents that we ended up uh, getting an interview with the inventors was from Juhanu, Juhani Sawini and he described this multi-generational odyssey his family has been on to invent the biospecific two-photon excitation fluorescent detection and device. This is, this is kind of like a, a microscope. I think I mean, that's probably really oversimplifying it. And they spent decades pursuing this device from father to son and brother handed down. And as Jukhani noted, we have a long-term research tradition from the 60s. It was a long research path. My father, my brother, myself. My father is so stubborn. The intuition is so strong and, and the will to do it was just so strong. It's a way of thinking. So he basically described his father as just being too stubborn to quit and, and, and going incremental step, incremental step, bringing in ex outsiders to help with the research until they generated this, this research. Um, it's very similar in a way to what Tom, the Thomas Edison multiple case study that I studied. So if you know anything about Thomas Edison, you know that he was nothing if not persistent. He was a tenacious guy, almost pathologically so. He would stay in his lab till three or four o'clock in the morning, fall asleep on the bench at around four o'clock in the morning, wake up and just start working again. Seriously neglected his wives because of this, but was just a really doggedly persistent man. And um, there's this great story about when he was working on an uh, electric storage battery, he wanted to invent a battery for an electric vehicle, and he was working on batteries in general. And his friend, Walter Mallory, had realized, had, just, had found out that Thomas Edison had made over 9,000 unsuccessful experiments in trying to devise this new type of storage battery. So he comes in and he makes the mistake of saying to Edison, oh, isn't it a shame that with the tremendous amount of work you've done, you haven't been able to get any results. And Edison turns around like a flash and gives it this big smile and he says, results, why man, I've gotten lots of results. I know several thousand things that don't work. So this is a, a, an oft repeated story of Edison. He had a very similar path in the, in the light bulb of, of exploring filaments. He just didn't quit and pursued a very long search path. Now I'm gonna tell you about one of my favorite breakthroughs. It was the, it turns out when we interviewed the inventor, I knew about the breakthrough years ago. I wrote a case, a short case about it, I don't know, 15 years ago, and then ended up getting to talk to one of the inventors on it just recently as a result of this study and what a journey they were on. And this invention is the spider goat. Now, I, I know you're thinking this is a spider, this spider goat, surely just a creation of Marvel comics, something that you might see in the movies, but no, in fact, the spider goat is a real goat, a genetically engineered goat. That, is that has been engineered to produce spider silk. And we're gonna talk about why here in a minute. But it, it doesn't actually look like this. It uh, looks like this. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't actually look like that either, yikes. Um, it just looks like a goat. Okay. So this goat on the right is a pygmy goat that lactates spider silk. And um, let's talk about the path that led to this goat and why it happened. And we're gonna start with this man here. 
This is Jeffrey Turner, and he was getting his PhD studying cows and the mammary gland. And he was working on genetically modifying the mammary gland of cows in order to produce lactose-free milk. So that seems like a very practical application, right? But at some point he realized, wait, if I can modify their mammary glands to, to produce lactose-free milk, I can actually modify them to produce any protein I want. And maybe I should think about what the highest value protein could possibly be that you could, that you could make in a mammary gland. And he thought, what about spider silk? Now I know you're thinking that's crazy, but here's the thing about spider silk. Spider silk has the strongest strength to weight ratio of any substance on earth. It's amazing stuff. In fact, if you make a spider silk rope about the size of your pinky or a pencil, that spider silk rope can stop a 747 in flight. It's wildly strong, wildly light, and there are lots of really interesting applications for it, but the problem is it's really hard to farm spiders. They're territorial, they can be, they're you know, cannibalistic, it's very hard to milk them. No, I'm just kidding, you wouldn't milk them. Um, couldn't help myself. But what if you could get spider silk proteins another way? So Jeffrey Turner asked his colleague, Costas Karatsas, what about uh, engineering spider silk to be lactated from a ruminant? And Costas being the easygoing, go with the flow kind of guy said, of course, spider silk, that's interesting. But Costas had the uh, good insight to say, you know, let's not start with cows. Cows are big, expensive animals, difficult to handle, takes a while before they're old enough to lactate. Let's start with something simple and less expensive, easy to work with. Let's start with a mouse. So here's something you didn't know. There were actually spider mice, genetically engineered mice that could lactate spider silk proteins long before there was spider genetically modified anything else. They didn't actually use the milk from the mice. They just wanted to prove it in principle. Then they decided, you know, let's not go with cows. I mean, cows are really large and a somewhat inconvenient animal. Let's go with goats. And in the process, and, and you know, let's go with a small goat, like a pygmy goat. And let's actually breed this goat to breed early and lactate early. So they ended up modifying a goat to breed early and lactate early and ended up getting a separate, extremely valuable patent out of that goat. So once they had the breed early lactate or, uh, pygmy goat, they could generate the fibers that would enable them to spin spider silk rope. Uh, this turned out to be a very expensive process. Uh, and the company basically nearly went bankrupt in the, in the process. Actually did go bankrupt, I want to say, in the process and was bailed out by the army. The army now owns this technology. So I think they're exploring it for things like uh, bulletproof vests and things like that. But I love this quote Costas gave about the process. He said, again, totally unprompted, there were lots of small incremental steps along the way. You go from a piece of DNA all the way to something soluble, but that's not the end of it. All the other companies would stop there. Here you have the goat, but you're way, way far from the final product because the goat is now your starting material. You need to take it and modify it to become a fiber, and that fiber has to become a product. So what Costas is referring to is that in addition to the path I've shown you here, it was actually quite complicated to develop the machinery involved to spin out the fibers and then to spin them into a rope because spiders are quite sophisticated. Spiders actually produce two separate parts of the spider silk separately and then blend them right at the point of exit from the spider. And so you have to find a way to mimic that because if they blend in the mammary gland, it crystallizes and your goat's not gonna lactate at all. So anyway, probably more information than you needed about lactation there, but such a fascinating story demonstrating how a long, entirely rational search path ended up being something kind of, you know, fantastical. Okay, let's talk about key finding number four. And this is probably a source of where some of that persistence and tenacity comes from, and maybe a source of why uh, some inventors have been willing to enter fields that you just wouldn't have expected them in. And that is, it, it appears that for a lot of cases, the breakthrough was arising because an inventor had some idealistic goal they were pursuing. And let's just talk about idealism for just a second, because idealism is, is pretty interesting of itself. It's, it's certainly got some downsides too, but let's talk about the upsides. Idealism is this huge repository of intrinsic motivation, right? Idealism is when you're pursuing something that you believe is intrinsically noble, intrinsically worthwhile, valuable in and of itself. So it's providing intrinsic motivation. And we, we already know from a lot of other studies that intrinsic motivation is extremely valuable for creativity and innovation. So suppose you have this idealism providing this big well 
of uh, intrinsic motivation that keeps you pursuing something very hard, long hours, maybe outside of your field. It also provides a form of ego defense, which is a source of resilience. And what I mean by this is that people pursuing a goal that they believe is intrinsically noble are able to take a lot of abuse. It's not about them, right? The goal might be more important than money. It might be more important than accolades or reputation. It might be more important than personal comfort or health. It might be more important than their family. So the goal is so much more valuable than themselves that they become very willing to sacrifice themselves to the goal, which we could have a whole other talk about the, the downsides of that. You have to be careful about that too. But one of the things that it did for a lot of inventors is it made them relatively impervious to criticism. Right, so Benjamin Franklin, Elon Musk, all these guys took a lot of criticism and they just kept going because they believed that what they were doing was so important. And that was true for a lot of the innovators I studied. So if you, if you read, it's all over Steve Jobs, if you read his quotes, like he says here, the thing that bound us together at Apple was the ability to make things that were going to change the world. That was very important. Changing the world was so much more important to Steve than having a strong commercial product. Then let's talk about Nikola Tesla. Uh, with Nikola Tesla, the best quote I found actually came from someone who knew him well talking about him. And it said his, that Nikola Tesla, in case you don't know, invented AC electricity and a bunch of forms of lighting and the first uh, remote control automaton, so the first robots. Uh, very interesting and weird guy. And what Barnard says about Tesla is his spirit is naturally hopeful. He looks to a time when power shall be so cheap, so universal, that all labor shall be done by tireless machines, and every man's life be thus so much more worth living. So Nikola Tesla believed that if we could get rid of the burdensome part of ordinary work, we would be able to dedicate ourselves to a more enlightened being, creative pursuits, literature, poetry, music. And uh, Tesla saw that as his mission in the world to remove burdensome labor from humans and also to create wireless communication so that everybody could talk to each other because he thought that would obviate war. All right, now let's talk about Dean Kamen. Dean Kamen was the one I told you invented all that medical technology. Well, he also invented the Sterling, he invented a uh, slingshot water purifier based on a Sterling engine. And this is a water purifier that can run on anything kind of moist it, and it can turn anything kind of moist into drinkable, potable water. And he demonstrates it at conferences by urinating into it and then by drinking it, which, which most people find really compelling. And he ended up having to spend a lot of his own money on it because it turns out the countries uh, that need clean drinking water often don't have a lot of money to spend on clean drinking water. And people said, what are you doing spending all that money? And he said, look, I'm, I'm a little company, and that's a lot of money, but I believe in it. I just believe in it. It might fail, but you've got to try. Look at the state of the world. It's a mess. What if we can fix it? So here is a man that was driven to help people who were suffering from injury and disease and just decided to invent medical innovations without medical training, decided he's going to solve also the problem of clean water, so idealism. And then the last one I'm going to bring up here is actually a video. So let's hope this works. I'm interested in things that, that change the world or, or that affect the future. How did you figure you were going to start a car company and be successful at it? Well, I, I didn't really think Tesla would be successful. I thought we would most likely fail. But you say you didn't expect the company to be successful? Then why try? If something's important enough, you should try, even if you, the probable outcome is failure. Okay, that's a pretty important line there. If something's important enough, you should try, even if the probable outcome is failure. And as a lot of you already know, as a lot of you have followed the Elon Musk story, at the time that he, they were launching Tesla and SpaceX kind of simultaneously, uh, he basically ran completely out of money. He, the first three Tesla rocket launches exploded in the air. They were on their last, last bit of money. Tesla was, was struggling. SpaceX was, on, was, was going to run out of money. He was almost on the verge of personal bankruptcy. He was sleeping on his friend's couch. He was also going through a divorce. He was in this state of incredible pressure, right? And uh, one of his friends, Antonio Gracias, talks about, you know, Musk, like, I've never seen anyone endure as much pain as Musk. He can take pain like nobody else. And it's because he believed that what he was working on was bigger than him. It mattered more than him. If even you, if something's important enough, you should try, even if the probable outcome is failure. 
which in this case would have been complete bankruptcy of himself and a lot of the people around the companies he had built. So thank you for, for listening on that note. I just want to say thank you so much for being here and giving me some time to talk about this research and for coming to our conference. And I'm going to, we're going to open it up now to questions, which I believe Foster is going to help moderate. And oh, I need to unshare my screen so that I can see him. By the way, uh, if you need to contact me, there's my contact information down there. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Foster. Wait, Foster, I can't hear you. Are you muted? Yeah, sorry. No, my mic was separately muted, uh, but now hopefully you can hear me. I can hear you. Thank All you. Right. So thanks a lot. Uh, again, uh, that was fascinating. I. Uh, uh, I was happy to actually read the uh, the spider goat story last night <laughs> in your paper. Um, I shared that with my daughter, and she thought it was crazy. Like, Does I she believe lying. it was real? Because a lot of people don't believe it's real in the beginning. I think she believed it real because I was sitting next to her pointing to it in the paper. So. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I thought maybe I'd start um, the... I've been fascinating with in, fascinated with innovators uh, for a long time. Uh, by the way, loved uh, your book, Quirky. Thank Everybody you. should read Quirky. Um, the, um, so back when, um, when I first joined the phone company, which was the fall of 1994, um, uh, one of the things that they had me do was help them to decide, um, help them rationalize how to actually spend the small 10-15% uh, of the budget that was focused on exploratory work. So I spent a long time in the research, reading the research management literature and so on. This was supposed to be stuff that maybe had 20% chance of success or less, you know, stuff like that, right? Uh, and the one thing that, I, I've forgotten most of it, but the one thing that really stuck with me was this sort of finding that they had, which was, um, was um, there's really only one factor if you're getting a proposal for a research project that is, uh, indicative of success, and it's very strongly indicative of success, right? And that's the prior success of the investigator, which led to some complications of how we were going to deal with that, of course. But um, I'm wondering, is this something that you see in your in your in your in your research on this? This was the you know sort of the literature that I read 30, 25 years ago. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, there's some confounds in there because people who've had prior success have learned how to work the channels and get access to funding and solve problems. And so certainly, there's a learning curve. And it's also interesting to note. Uh, I've known a lot of entrepreneurs, and every successful entrepreneur I've known has been a serial entrepreneur. So a lot of them you wouldn't maybe consider successful in their early ventures, but they were they learned something, or they were successful enough to take a little money and then parlay it into their next venture, and then a little bit more money out of that one and parlay it into their next venture. And maybe that one fails spectacularly, but they've learned from the past that they can do it, so they do yet another venture. So it's it's super fascinating how like you know that, that really entrepreneurship in and of itself is is both kind of a learned skill. And it's also maybe like an obsessive behavior. <laughs> you know, people who want to invent and, and build things and create things, they want to do that. And they, they're really compelled to do it. Um, in terms of looking at someone's prior success, I mean, the risk of, yes, certainly if you only look at people who are successful, you're more likely to get successful breakthrough innovations. Now, the downside is you're also going to screen out some stuff, right? You're going to screen out some weird, wild, wonderful stuff because they're going to be people who come up with radical breakthroughs out of the gate who maybe, who maybe um, doesn't mean that they would be successful on their own, but maybe with your help, they would be successful with them. And, you know, that certainly plays to this idea of I come to a field, I don't have experience in it, and I'm willing to consider a totally different solution, that sort of outsider benefit. So, you know, it kind of depends on what kind of innovations you're looking at and how much type one and type two error you're willing to bear is what I would say about yeah, that. So one of the things that we did, by the way, because the, the, the um, I think which is implicit in your answer, I mean, one of the um, drawbacks of just using that <laughs> to decide who gets the funding for, for such research is especially is that you, um, you essentially filter out people who are young, and I mean career young, doesn't matter what their physical age is, right? But, but career young. Yeah. And so the idea that the, 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 the kind of the process that we were advocating was early on, you give people a chance 
you know, if time after time they just kind of don't succeed, maybe they should be doing something else rather than rather than innovating. And by the way, this is essentially what the NSF does, right? It gives yeah. career awards to young uh, scientists based upon um, promise, not success. You know, and then later career, frankly, in the NSF panels, there's an awful lot of, you know, sort of things that actually depend upon the success of, of, the, uh, of the investigator. Um, yeah, I mean, if you only if you only trust people who've already had success, you're going to get a huge Matthew effect, right? Where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, and you're going to eventually extinguish all your variety, right? You're going to narrow down the scope of the kinds of innovations you're willing to look at that way. You think you're going to... Um... I guess I'm not sure that it necessarily follows that the people who are successful are doing the same things. Maybe the people who are successful are doing wacky, crazy, different things. Some of them, for sure. Yeah, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't exclude that possibility. But I do think that if you want to get a lot of cool ideas into the recombinatorial hopper, it's a good idea to have diversity in the pool of people you're considering and to take some risks yeah. on people who don't have a proven track record. Yeah, and this seems to fo follow along with some of the things that were in your talk. I, I recall from, um, what's it from? It's probably from uh, the book, The Act of Creation by Arthur Kessler. We talked about creating a position of kind of a novel context on a saturated mind, right? And so the one way is, right, a new person comes into a field, which you I think in your, at least in your paper, I forget whether that was in your talk as well. I think so, right? You know, but also it could be, there could be other ways of, of, of generating that. Let me see. There's a question in the um, chat specifically about AI. It says, what is, the, what is it about AI that will give an advantage over human specialists? Um, I'm not sure if that was left over from the last talk, but uh, if you have anything to say on that, or if you just have something to say about specifically about innovation in, in AI to tie together to the last uh, panel. Yeah. I mean, um, wow. That's a pretty big open question. <laughs> uh, and of course, obviously, how you train AI is, is super important. You could actually, you know, humans are prone to a lot of biases, and we tend to be fairly risk averse. And one of the interesting things is that breakthrough, uh, breakthrough innovations tend to be ugly when you first see them. Like when somebody first comes to you with a breakthrough idea, you're like, yuck, because it just doesn't conform to your sense of norms, and it seems disruptive, and you may not understand it. And the odds of you having traveled the cognitive path that led that, that inventor to that breakthrough, you probably didn't follow that path. So from your perspective, it's just weird. And so humans have this slight natural aversion, I, on average, not all of us, but a lot of humans have a slight natural aversion to breakthroughs and certainly corporate uh, R&D managers and business development people might be a, a bit risk averse. Um, what a, one of the things you could do with AI is you could generate novelty in your project pool because you could, tr you could, you could, my, you know, you're the expert here, but I suspect you can code AI to not have that aversion in the same way. What do you think? Yeah, I think creativity in AI, I mean, using AI to stimulate creativity is a fascinating uh, uh, um, area. Uh, I'm not really an expert expert on that. Um, so maybe I'll skip it because uh, we'll keep making sure we answer the people's uh, questions and I can, def I can, I can not uh, embarrass myself by trying to answer the question. Um, so this is um, uh, a question from the uh, WOVA app. Um, what about uh, female inventors? Yeah, oh my God. Can I, let me just tell you, when I first started on this journey, when I started the multiple case study project, the first thing I did was set up a protocol so that the protocol was selecting innovators instead of me, because you don't want to introduce researcher bias, right? In fact, if somebody came to me and said, oh, you should study this person, like, like early on, somebody came to me and said, you should study Shockley. He was a really weird dude. Like, now I can't study Shockley because you just completely contaminated the process. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, only, the only people I started with as seeds of this idea were Jobs and Cayman, uh, because I had done, written case studies about both of them and had saw these remarkable similarities between them. But everybody else was selected by a research protocol. And the research protocol was scraping lists of, of most famous innovators, most famous inventions, and then selecting, and then subjecting them to criteria like, do they have multiple biographies written about them? Are they known for more than one innovation? Do they show up on multiple lists? Because, there, I mean, there had to be certain, I wanted them to be serial innovators, so that was important. I also wanted there to be enough information written about them to work with and to have first person accounts, like letters they wrote, interviews they gave. And when I did all that, I initially got one woman, Marie Curie, and I practically had a panic attack. And I was like, you know, I, 
I definitely knew, and nope, I had, I had really no people of color in the entire set. Although it's not entirely fair to say because at different points in time, what has been of color has changed. So for example, in Tesla and Einstein's time, they would have not, have not have been considered white exactly, but that's beside the point, I guess. I was nervous. I'm like, I need more diversity on this set. And so I started looking at most famous women inventors, most famous women entrepreneurs, most famous African-American inventors, things like that. And then I suddenly realized, okay, I'm not being a scientist right now. What I'm doing is I'm bowing to the political pressure of the day and, and you know, in it, an expectation of blowback. And let me tell you, I got a lot of blowback. I was actually banned from giving talks at certain companies because my set was too white and too male. What are you gonna do? But I ultimately decided it was more important to be true to the scientific protocol and figure out what had led to this outcome because we can't change the past, right? But we can change the future. And you're only going to figure out how to change the future if you take a really honest look at the past. At the past, and when you take a look at the past, and you can, and then I started looking at some other female innovators just to get a sense of what's going on here. What you really quickly realize is that in the scope of time I was looking at for innovators, women's access to science and higher education and business was a very small sliver of it, right? Like women, Title IX that is said we don't can't have gender discrimination in higher education. That came out in 1970. That's like really recent, right? Even during the time Marie Curie was uh, wanting to go to school, most schools didn't allow women into higher education. And she, the, the country she grew up in, Poland, didn't allow women into college. So she had to travel to France and really struggle to get in, to, to find a way to pursue science as a woman. So when you study Marie Curie's story, you're like, oh, now I see why there's not more women in science because the path she took was incredibly, incredibly hard. And Grace Hopper, similarly, only was able to penetrate business and science because she became an admiral in the Navy. And she was only able to become an admiral in the Navy because she was a math genius who got recruited during the time when we needed people who could do really advanced math for targeting ballistic missiles and encryption. So the remarkableness of the stories of women to point out why we didn't see so many women in the past, but let's hope we're gonna see a lot more women in the future. So why don't I follow up with Kathleen's question from the panelist channel. Uh, what should um, higher education, business schools maybe in particular, but higher education do uh, to empower more innovators, be they uh, women or of color or white guys? Yeah, okay, so there's a lot of different things they can do. First of all, with respect to uh, getting more diversity there, you have, to, you have to find norms that enable more kinds of people to be disagreeable. So I think historically white men have, have been allowed kind of to be disagreeable. I think historically women weren't allowed to be disagreeable. And uh, you gotta be kind of disagreeable to be a breakthrough innovator because you have to challenge norms and you have to pursue things even when other people tell you it's gonna fail. So there's a lot of stuff there around not having consensus norms and uh, you know encouraging more dissent in the classroom perhaps, but more targeted. One of the things that was really clear from studying these innovators is that a lot of them were able to execute their innovations by being connected to other people who had access to resources that they needed or knowledge they needed. And one of the most fascinating thing about, about the inventors that came out of this protocol is that they were all dirt broke when they started. So none of these people came from wealth or affluence or privileged connections. They were all poor, frankly, all of them. They all bootstrapped their own way to success and were really, really self-made. Now, most of them were functioning in well-developed economies or moved to well-developed economies in order to get access to resources. But most of them, the key thing wasn't money and the key thing wasn't their own education. The key thing was, ac was accessing other people who would help them execute their ideas. We could do a lot better job in that in education. We tend to be pretty siloed. We make people specialize. We ha have them choose a path. We wanna see them build a lot of credits along that particular path. We could instead be encouraging, encouraging people to have other interests, study things on their own, and tell them, yeah, you can, you can study this field without having credentials in it, and we're gonna help connect you to other people we think can help answer questions for you or help get you the resources you need. More, more personalized curricula in general. So Winnie in the Q&A asked, uh, did you find age a factor in developing breakthrough innovations, affecting their risk tolerance, degree of idealism, timeline, life experience? And yeah, um, in this set, in this, this set of people stayed pretty breakthrough their entire lives. Uh, the one exception I'd say is maybe Einstein. Einstein became less active in theoretical physics over time, but became more active in politics. He was really a very strong advocacy of pacifism and, and 
uh, creating a, a Zion place and like he became more active in politics and less active in physics over time. But everybody else in this that I studied really worked on breakthrough innovation to their deathbeds. Like it was astonishing. Like uh, Tesla was working on a death ray when he when he was found dead in his hotel room, and there are still people in the FBI and the CIA looking to find that death ray. Some of his personal belongings were seized right after it was known that he died. A whole bunch of stuff was seized and absconded away because there was some secrecy about what he was working on, like a giant laser. Uh, Thomas Edison worked right up into his late, late 80s. I'm pretty sure he was working to the day he died. He was working actually on a mining technology towards the end. Uh, I suspect we can expect to see the same with Elon Musk and Dean Kamen. And we definitely saw it with Marie Curie, but Marie Curie died rather young because of so much exposure to radium. So I'm curious um, about this, the fact that all of your inventors were poor, yeah. started out poor, start, of course they didn't all end poor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and uh, because in your, in your talk, you talked about a couple aspects of the character of the inventors, persistence, idealism. Um, I think also in there was a, was risk seeking, uh, be, you know, sort of risk. Or at least risk tolerance. Or risk, to or at least risk tolerance, right? Yeah. Um, and um, do you have a feeling for like, what was it about? Because it, obviously it wasn't the poor part because they continued to innovate even once they got some of them, the ones that got rich, yeah. <laughs> you know, continue to innovate. So what was it about starting poor? There's some, presumably some personality characteristic that uh, yeah. is aligned with innovating. You know, there's been some research on this that suggests, there's some research in sociology called the marginal man, and it should now be updated to be marginal person. But uh, this idea that when you're not a strong central member in a particular community, you have sort of less to lose, and you might have more feet in different communities. It was interesting um, studying Sergey Brin, for example, his family uh, came over, they left everything behind when they came over from, I believe it was Russia, as Russian uh, refusenik Jews, I think, coming into the U.S. I might have parts of the story wrong, I haven't looked at it in a while. But they started from nothing, but they were all, but they were very smart and very educated, and it made them scrappy. And Sergei talks about sort of this scrappy cultural identity. Um, so, so I don't know. I, I think that's a question that remains to be completely answered. But I think that there is something liberating in a way about not having much to lose. <laughs> All right, so let me, we're almost to the end. I'm gonna ask Rob's question. I think it's the, yeah. Um, uh, he says, uh, I, I follow you on Twitter where you've been consistently right about Musk and Tesla. Others on Twitter were very skeptical and thought your enthusiasm misplaced. It seems you've been proven right and them wrong. Haha. <laughs> Uh, what does the future hold for Musk and Tesla, and is the current stock run-up justified and sustainable? I've got my Great. fingers on buy and sell, by the way. Great question. <laughs> yeah, I've had a lot of battles online about Musk. Um, and to be clear, most of the battles early on were because I saw a side of it. If you study him really intensely for a long time, which I did, you see a side of him that maybe is not so obvious, and that is that he's not in it for the money at all. Right. So when people thought he was manipulating the stock price or, you know, people try to cast him as this greedy capitalist pig who swooped into this area, that's really mischaracterization. This is a person who just basically gave it all away to go into these fields. So he's, he's not about the money. He, he, he's, he already succeeded at money and he's like been there, done that. Now I'm going to do something else. Um, but but OK, so here's what I think. Tesla, I always have thought Tesla will be successful. The selling the cars, the trajectory was always there. And he had this incredible track record. Not everybody knows his whole track record. It goes all the way back to, you know, being a 19 year old developing the first city search portal and selling that to Compact for over $100 million. You know, he's, he's, he's had a very long track record of success. And he, he had enough statistics that what he was going to do was going to work. Now, the stock price, the problem with the stock price, that's kind of scary going record with this, is that the stock price has a lot of love in it. Right. And love is a dangerous thing to monetize in the stock market. Right. You the it's, love can be very irrational, as most of us know, which does, doesn't mean that his, it's not a great stock in the long run. But I do think it's been overpriced at particular times based on any metric you could use on, you know, net present value. And I think I think the biggest risk factor for Tesla is not being successful. Uh, is, it, no, 
I want to make sure I'm saying that unambiguously. I don't think the biggest risk factor for Tesla is that it will not be successful. I think it will absolutely be hugely successful and continue to be a, a incredible car company. I think the biggest risk factor is that Musk is not in it for the money. So you don't know what he's going to do. You don't know what left turn he's going to make at what moment to, per, to take that success and channel it to something that even more closely matches his idealistic pursuits. It did not surprise me at all that he wanted to take that company private because he wants to control it and make it do things that a board of directors might not let it do. And that's precisely why SpaceX is private. And he's announced it will stay private until they have secured Mars because a board of directors is going to make you make compromises. Cool. So thanks a lot. We're, our, time, our, our, our time's up. This was uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, Thank thanks. You. And um, yeah, uh, it was great. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for being a great moderator, Foster. Oh, yeah, well, um, I enjoyed it very much.